Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Inflammatory bowel disease. Well, what is it? It's an umbrella term that's used to describe disorders that cause chronic or long-standing inflammation of your digestive tract. There are basically two types, ulcerative colitis that causes ulcers or sores in the lining of your large intestine, the colon, and also your rectum, and Crohn's disease, inflammation of the lining of basically any part of your digestive tract. They both sound terrible. Well, they yeah, are, they unfortunately. Both, they both can be debilitating and sometimes lead to life-threatening complications. It's estimated there are some 3 million people in the U.S. who have inflammatory bowel disease. With us in studio is Mayo Clinic gastroenterologist and expert on inflammatory bowel disease, Dr. Ed Loftus. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Loftus. Thanks for having me. About 1% of the population, so over 3 million people who have inflammatory bowel disease in this country, and I think it's probably fair to say it's a pretty serious problem. It is. Well, like any disease, it can have a wide spectrum of severity, but this is a disease that if you are on the severe end of it, it can lead to colectomy, and um, there are many complications, including colon cancer, and so these patients need to be carefully monitored. And if you think about it, if you're having diarrhea and urgency all the time, this is a life-altering symptom where you, you're afraid to leave the house. Everywhere you go, you need to know where the bathroom is. And so this can really impact a patient's day-to-day -day quality of life. When you said colectomy, you meaning that some patients, the disease is so severe that they have to have their colon removed. Correct. Uh, we, we did a study here in Olmstead County looking at about 40 years worth of follow-up and roughly 30% of the patients required a colectomy at some point in their clinical course. Fortunately, nowadays, I think that number is lower with the advent of newer medications, but that just gives you an idea of how substantial this could be. You mentioned diarrhea. What are some of the other symptoms? Well, for ulcerative colitis, we're talking diarrhea and rectal bleeding primarily. Uh, for Crohn's disease, which again, as you mentioned, affects anywhere in the inflammatory tract, most commonly in the ileum, which is the bottom part of the small intestine, uh, the, mo the most common symptoms are abdominal pain and diarrhea. Do we have any idea what causes this? You said that it, it tends to run, can run in families, but what's the underlying cause? Do we know? We, the short answer is we don't know, but the leading hypothesis is that this is an immune-mediated disease. There's probably an underlying genetic susceptibility uh, related to genes that regulate the immune system in the gut, and then there is some event that comes along and triggers this process of uncontrolled inflammation. It's almost as if the immune system has forgotten the ability to distinguish between friend and foe. So it's reacting as if you're having, say, a bad gastroenteritis, but it doesn't know how to turn itself off. So it's your body attacking itself in a way? In a way, yeah. It's, in both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis? We think so. We think s slightly different genes are involved. The type of inflammation is different. In ulcerative colitis, it's a more superficial layer of inflammation, whereas in Crohn's disease, it can be a full thickness inflammation involving the entire bowel wall. And Crohn's disease has more complications such as stricturing or narrowing of the, of the intestine due to scar tissue or fistulizing, which is a fistula is like a tunneling tract of inflammation that can go from the bowel to somewhere else and that can cause either an abscess or recurrent bladder infections, things like that. Mm. So in both of these diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, are you more likely to get cancer of either the small or the large bowel? More so in the large bowel. There is an increased risk of small bowel cancer in Crohn's disease. At most, uh, maybe 1% of all Crohn's patients might get small bowel cancer. Uh, with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis, Crohn's involving the colon, uh, maybe up to 10% of patients are at risk for colon cancer. So you mentioned the hereditary component, the um, gut health component, that immune system component. What about diet and stress? Correct. Uh, the, there are epidemiologic studies suggesting that diet is involved in Basically, too much sugar is probably bad for Crohn's. Too much animal fat is probably bad for ulcerative colitis. But beyond that, you know, dietary studies are really, really hard to do. 
Um, you basically have to lock somebody in a unit and control their food access to really know what the patient's diet really is. And so these have been difficult studies to perform. And uh, surprisingly, it's one of the final frontiers of epidemiology of IBD, understanding the role that diet plays. Stress is definitely a factor. You see this day to day, week to week in the office. Patients said, yeah, I was stressed out about this and I had a flare of my Crohn's or colitis. Um, and it's sort of educating the patient. It's not just the stress, it's how you handle the stress. And whatever technique is good for them to handle stress is, is a good way for them to manage this. If, if that's getting outside to walk or exercise or prayer, meditation, yoga, what have you. I would imagine if, I mean, if it's pain or if it's blood in the stool, if those kind of symptoms show up, that people are more likely to come in. But if it's fecal incontinence, if it's diarrhea, are patients likely to come in or are they likely to just try to manage this on their own? Well, they often manage it on their own and often they're told by their initial physician that, oh, it's just some irritable bowel. So sometimes we do see patients that in retrospect, it's obvious that they've had the condition for years. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, when they have pain or alarm symptoms like bleeding, that usually means they come in pretty Yeah, that'll quick. get them yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the, the, the most common symptoms, uh, diarrhea and bloody stools, is that correct? And, and, and then when these patients uh, finally get referred to someone like yourself, how do you, there's lots of causes of diarrhea, and a lot of people have diarrhea, how do you finally decide that they have either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? How well, do you make the diagnosis? So you, you might be getting some blood <clears throat> tests, they might have an anemia, or they might have an elevated white cell count. Anemia um, because they've lost so much because blood. They've bl they low blood count. Cor correct. Um, oftentimes, with that history of blood in the stool, that's probably going to prompt a colonoscopy. So many of these patients, that's really how oftentimes the diagnosis is made via colonoscopy. In the case of Crohn's disease, if it's small intestinal Crohn's disease, it might be above the reach of the colonoscope, in which case imaging like a CT enterography or an MR enterography might be the way to help make the diagnosis. And is it based on a biopsy or can you tell just by looking through the scope? Ideally, it's based by biopsy. In some cases, you don't have a biopsy and you, you can make that diagnosis by looking. But ultimately, we especially when we start prescribing some of the more complicated medications, it's better to have a biopsy-proven diagnosis. And you talked about colonoscopy, but if the disease is up in the small intestine, uh, then the colonoscope won't go up that high. How do you figure that out? Well, we have specialized uh, endoscopic techniques. There's one called balloon-assisted endoscopy or double balloon endoscopy, and we can use an overtube with balloons on the scope in the overtube and kind of march our way higher up into the small intestine and obtain tissue that way. But it's a highly specialized procedure. For example, in our department, there are only two or three doctors who do that procedure. Our guest is gastroenterologist and an expert on inflammatory bowel disease, Dr. Ed Loftus. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about treatment of both of these diseases, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, including surgical options. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are talking with an expert on inflammatory bowel disease, Mayo Clinic gastroenterologist, Dr. Ed Loftus. We've talked about the symptoms, the complications, the diagnosis. The causes. I, yeah, exactly. And before uh, we go on to treatment, I want to ask you, in your experience, uh, what's the longest you've ever seen a patient go without being diagnosed? Having a problem of, of diarrhea or bloody stools and just never went to see anybody or never got diagnosed. Is that fairly common? It's, it's not very common, but it definitely happens. And I've seen patients that literally I know that in retrospect they've had symptoms for 30 years. So um, it Affecting can, their daily life. It can. Yeah. And yet they're right. And, and I think out of uh, perhaps embarrassment mm -hmm. or just a fear of the diagnostic procedures or a fear of treatment, um, they, they choose to ignore. It's, it's very similar to colorectal cancer screening, right? People don't want to come in for their colonoscopy. Fortunately, we have better tools now, but it's the same phenomenon, I think. 
What, uh, before we get to treatment, what are complications of this? I mean, if you're just managing it, if it's just something you feel like you have to deal with, but right. what are complications? Well, in, in the case of ulcerative colitis, if the colitis gets very severe, it may be severe enough to require hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And if the medical treatments don't work, then, then surgery. In the case of Crohn's disease, it's a little bit more complex. You can develop, through chronic inflammation, you can develop scar tissue, and that scar tends to contract and cause a narrowing, and so patients will develop obstructive symptoms. So they'll have more pain, or they'll get their abdomen will get distended, or mm. they'll have nausea and vomiting. If that happens very slowly and chronically, they adjust, but if it happens acutely, then they often end up hospitalized with a bowel obstruction, and that might necessitate a surgery. Another complication is a fistula. We talked about that a little bit earlier, but fistulas can lead to intra-abdominal abscesses or lead to fistulas to other organs, which can be problematic. And so explain, often, explain fistula for us. So a fistula is, think of the, the lining of the bowel gets an ulcer, and that ulcer becomes deeper and deeper and actually penetrates through the full thickness of the bowel wall and then creates like a tunneling tract of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so that little tract of inflammation goes to other areas and either causes an abscess or, so for example, uh, women with Crohn's disease can get rectovaginal fistulas, which can be very problematic because then they're chronically getting either air or sometimes even stool via the vagina. And uh, it comes from the rectum. And it comes from the rectum. Yeah, into the, the vagina. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, so those can be very, uh, you can Im imagine that's very disruptive. Uh, what about impact. ulcerative colitis? What are complications there? Uh, well, you, we talked about some of the intestinal complications, but people can get what we call extra intestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease. So they can get inflammation in other parts of the body. So for example, the joints. So there are about up to 20 to 25% of patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease can get a secondary arthritis. Mm. Uh, oftentimes by treating the bowel inflammation, the joint inflammation improves as well. Wow. Other areas Areas of inflammation include the eye, uveitis, or the skin. There's a condition called pyoderma gangrenosum where they can get an ulcer in the skin, again, often driven by the disease activity of the bowel. And then finally, uh, there's uh, about 5% of patients with ulcerative colitis get uh, bile duct inflammation, and they get a condition called primary sclerosing cholangitis, or PSC for short. And that can lead to liver cirrhosis and sometimes needing liver transplantation. All sorts of complications. Yes. All right, well, let's talk about treatment. Hopefully, you, you've got some good treatments available for both these diseases. Right. For, for, for ulcerative colitis, we have a, a group of... Um, oral medications that are almost like a cousin of aspirin called the amino salicylates. And this includes medications like mesalamine or balsalazide. And these are delayed release drugs that coat the lining of the colon and reduce inflammation in a fairly nonspecific way. And they're fairly safe medications, and those are often our first-line therapies in ulcerative colitis. Mm -hmm. For patients who don't respond to that or patients who have uh, more severe symptoms, we'll sometimes use corticosteroids like prednisone. Um, if they're really severe, we might use IV steroids in the hospital. And then there are a group of medications called the biologics, and biologics are basically synthetic proteins that look like antibodies, but those antibodies, instead of being directed against bacteria, are directed against certain important inflammatory molecules. So drugs like infliximab, also known as Remicade, or adalimumab, also known as Humira, are drugs that we use in ulcerative colitis and in Crohn's disease. Um, other drugs in this uh, biologic class include vetolizumab or Entivio, which blocks a different set of molecules. Vetolizumab is interesting because it's gut selective. It's not suppressing the entire immune system. It's actually interfacing only with certain molecules in the gut that basically prevent the white cells from leaving the blood vessels in the gut. And so therefore there's, there's a gut selective immunosuppression, but not systemic immunosuppression. Um, there's another drug called ustekinumab or Stellara, which is approved for psoriasis and got approved for Crohn's disease about two and a half years ago. And that's also another good anti-inflammatory medication. Can you repeat the name of those drugs for me, Tracy? <laughs> I cannot, but I want to know, it, it, with, for most patients, if they take a medication, does it treat their symptoms or 
do they have to continue along looking for more treatment? It's an excellent question because um, historically, we did base our treatment just on symptoms. And if the patient was feeling well, we didn't adjust their medications. And there's been increasing recognition over the last 15 years or so that there's not a complete one-to-one -one correlation between symptoms and what's going on in the gut. And so we've become much more diagnostically aggressive in terms of looking to see, are we actually healing the lining of the bowel? either via colonoscopy or via imaging to make sure that we're making progress. And we borrowed a term from the rheumatologist called treat to target. And the idea is if the target is the absence of gut inflammation, then we need to assess the patient at baseline, give the medication, and then reassess the patient to see if we're making progress. Obviously, symptoms are still important, but we also want to objectively see that we're decreasing inflammation. And it's probably only by doing that objectively that we'll ever change the natural history of these conditions. Do these patients need surgery? Sometimes they do, yes. Uh, we have, um, in, in Crohn's disease, up to two-thirds of patients require a bowel resection at some time, often due to those complications we talked about earlier, like the stricture or the fistula. Um, unfortunately, in Crohn's, the challenge is that you're not out of the woods with one surgery. Um, among the people who have had one resection, about 60% of them require a second resection. And so there's still you still have to be vigilant after surgery to monitor these patients for recurrence of Crohn's disease and sometimes get back on medical therapy. And then you mentioned for ulcerative, ulcerative colitis, if it gets bad enough, you may have to remove the colon. If you have to do that, then, then what happens? Well, there's two options. One is to have a permanent ileostomy. Uh, the second option... Okay, so ileostomy means that you connect up the ileum to the skin. Right, to the skin and the so abdominal So you have wall. no colon at all. Right, and then okay, you, and wear you, have an a bag. you wear a bag and you empty that appliance maybe four to six times a day. And it sounds terrible, but actually most patients who undergo it feel an improvement in their quality of life because then they can leave the house. They have more predictability and doing the activities of daily living. The other surgery is J-pouch surgery, or the fancy name is ileal pouch anal anastomosis, but you create a pouch out of the bottom of the small intestine, and when you remove the rectum, you attach this pouch to basically the very, very bottom of the rectum or the anus. And so then it's a, it's a two or three stage surgery, but the patient is able to move their bowels through the anus. Uh, it's not a normal bowel habit. Patients might have six to seven stools daily, but they feel significantly better than they did prior to the surgery. Wow. Well, an interesting disease. And basically you said that there are two types of medications to treat these diseases, the anti-inflammatory drugs to decrease the inflammation, and the second uh, set class of drugs was to decrease the immune response. Correct. The biologics it decreased the immune response. The good news is there's lots of new drugs in the pipeline. We, we had, just for example, another ulcerative colitis drug approved just last May. It's a small molecule, but it modulates the immune system. And there are at least six or seven drugs in the drug development pipeline. So in the, in the next three or four years, I think we'll have more medication options for patients. Perfect. The more treatments, the better, huh? Yes. All right. More than 3 million people in the United States who have inflammatory bowel disease. It's, it's a serious condition with lots of uh, potential complications. And fortunately, multiple treatments available and more on the horizon. We've been talking with an inflammatory bowel disease expert and gastroenterologist at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Ed Loftus. Dr. Loftus, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks again for having me.